Why is, why is, this is, again, we're going to another subject here. Why is having good moral character important for a Muslim? Give us a few stellar examples that strike your heart from our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam and his pure family. Well, without a doubt, uh, as in if someone asks you what is a human being, you reply morals. As in if you reply anything else, then you could say that these are what any animal can even have. What differentiates us between uh, any other creation is our morality. You know, um, because there are times when you could say a human being resembles an animal or even worse than their morality. Try go Friday night downtown to certain areas and you'll wonder, is that a human or is that an animal who's walking in the road? And in some cases, that's disrespect even to the animal because the animal in some cases can maintain their discipline. So you find that we as human beings, um, our self-respect comes from purification of our soul and the faculties within the soul. Faculties such as anger, desire, Imagination have to be tamed by the faculty of reason. And the faculty of reason, if it can tame these, it will tame the spontaneous reactions which an animal can have, but a human's meant to have discipline on. The Prophet ﷺ says, Indeed, I have been sent to perfect the morals of mankind. And the Quran states, You are a man of sublime morals. In other words, the best example of morals in our history is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Like all prophets, like the Imams, they were the embodiment of perfect ethics on this earth. I'll never forget that story where you have that uh, lady who keeps throwing trash at him every morning. And yet he doesn't reply to her. Some of us would pick up the trash and break a window. He keeps walking past. Every morning he walks past. Every morning he walks past. Until when he hears that she's ill, he goes to visit her. She says to him, Muhammad, I can throw trash at you. You come visit me? He said, I heard you're ill. And it's uh, obligatory on us to go and visit someone who is sick or who is not feeling well. So that time of morals attracted people towards the religion. Likewise, Imam Ali alayhi salam, you find that famous story where that lady didn't recognize him. One day when he was walking, she started cursing him. He said, so why? Uh, she, uh, she didn't recognize him and she said, Curse on Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, so why are you cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib? She said, that man took my husband and my brothers to war and he came back alive and they died. I hate the man. So he said, how are you living now? She said, I'm living as a mother of orphans. He said, do you mind if I make bread for you every morning? She said, no problem. So every morning he'd come and make bread for her. One day as he's leaving, her daughter's come back from a journey. She sees him. She says, mom, did you see who that was in our house? She said, I don't know who the man is, but such a nice man. She said, that's Ali ibn Abi Talib. She said, that's Ali ibn Abi Talib. And I've been cursing him so much. And you even find that graduates from their school, like Malik al-Ashtar, for example, and others who graduated with the embodiment of akhlaq, Malik al-Ashtar, command of Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam's armed forces, one day is walking past a person who's selling, uh, walking in the market, and a person who had sold dates had the stones, and he threw them on Malik, and he started laughing. Malik walked away. One of the people said, do you know who you just threw that at? He said, no, I don't. So that's Malik al-Ashtar, Ali ibn Talib's commander of the, of the forces. This person ran to look for Malik al-Ashtar. He found him in the mosque praying. He waited for him to finish his prayer. As soon as he finished, he said to him, please forgive me for what I did. I didn't know it was you. To which Malik replied, don't worry, I came to the mosque to ask Allah to forgive you. So that embodiment of morals is what we as Muslims have to have in our communities today. In some cases, it's missing. I tell you in some cases, we have some members of our community. That's if they come to the community regularly. There are some who hardly ever come, and they are the most arrogant individuals you'll find. Mainly out of insecurity, you'll find their arrogance. But anyway, you find that there is a need for us to go back to the morals of the Prophet Sallallahu My final question, and this, this question is going to focus on sexual education. This is quite a taboo subject. Nobody, no, a lot of parents do not want their kids to talk about this subject. They don't want to talk with their children about it, and and they don't want to teach them. How? What is the stance of sexual education in Islam? Is this something that we should talk to our children, or is this something we should just keep, you know, and let let the uh, people like Oprah Winfrey teach our kids? Well, uh, as you know, uh, I had uh, I had lecture last year on Islam and sex, and you know proved to be very beneficial 
uh, show controversial because people have said that this very taboo subject. But Alhamdulillah, praise be to God, that went fantastically. And I felt that the reason that we had to give that lecture was because of the fact that we were facing a lot of issues in sexual education, but nobody was daring or had the confidence or the audacity uh, to speak out on the issue. I believe sexual education, you can look at it in two ways. If I'm going to teach sexual education, first and foremost, there should be a communication between the parents and the school which is going to teach it, for example. Then, positively, sexual education should be taught if the intention is, for example, the protection against physical abuse cases where you make the children aware so that just in case that child watches something where they're like, you know what, I'm being abused and I want to talk to someone about it because we've got some ridiculous and absolutely horrific physical sexual abuse cases in the world today. And it's vital that the children are made aware that they can speak out. If, however, the aim of sexual education is also, one may argue, is also the protection against sexual disease, okay, it's good. But I don't want the aim of sexual education to be, you know what, if you are going to have uh, sex, then make sure you use contraceptives. Mm -hmm. In other words, number one, that's just, in some cases, as Jermaine Greer would say, that's just in the hands of capitalists who want to make sure, make sure they make money from contraception. Because mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're really saying to that youth, have sex, but have, make sure you have a contraceptive, not guard your chastity. SubhanAllah. And what we want to see is a guarding of the chastity. You know, they make fun of the virgin these days, don't they? So, if, for example, in the 40-year-old virgin, you know, you're making yeah. fun of that virgin. Um, or even in the film Black Swan, he looks at the character and says to her, what, are you still a virgin? Wants a dark side to emerge from her. Nothing of respect for any guarding of chastity. So likewise here with this, if sexual education is going to tell the youth, you know what, have sex as much as you want, but just use contraceptives, then that's devoid of morality. That's devoid of consciousness. That's devoid of respect for other people's families and their, and their honor. If, however, it is that, you know what, guard your chastity, protect it until the time comes when you can be in unison with someone else, then without a doubt, sexual education is vital. Does Islam talk about sex? Without a doubt, we have thousands of traditions from Imams of Ahlul Bayt who discuss every aspect of sex that can be imagined. Because if Islam is a holistic way of life, it can't just be talking about, let's say, law and economics or ethics. It has to also talk about the part of ethics that is sexual ethics as well. Mm -hmm. And there is many important works, both early and medieval literature, uh, which discuss um, sexual ethics in Islam. Well. Brother, again, it was definitely a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Keep much. up your good work. And, and mashallah, you. you keep doing Thank the you best very you can much. for Thank us. You. Thank you very much. I really much. appreciate uh, Thank you. you doing, you, you coming over here and you, you're imparting your knowledge to us because, you know, you are a progressive uh, uh, person. Thank you. And uh, not a lot of people do what you do. And alhamdulillah, to talk about certain taboo subjects or controversial subjects is very important because it, it creates that, uh, that, uh, that concept of dialogue and it, and, it, and it fosters that concept of dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd just like to say to everyone, thank you for listening as well. And do not forget us in your prayers as well. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.